we can use Gauss's law to figure out what's the electric field at some point P located on the interior of a solid conducting metal sphere. So we're going to locate the center as the origin and then just make a line that points radial outward and call that the radial axis. So whenever we use Gauss's law, we want to choose a Gaussian surface with um, convenient symmetry. So if I want to find the electric field at point P, I want my Gaussian surface uh, to reside concentric with the charge and coinciding with the point in question. So there's a good Gaussian surface. And we start with a statement of Gauss's law as our first line of work. The total electric flux is equal to the amount of charge inside the Gaussian surface divided by the permittivity of free space. Because we've uh, chosen good symmetry, then we can say EDA equals Q in over epsilon naught. Well, actually, that's not even correct. It doesn't matter the symmetry in this case. Really, what matters is Q in is equal to zero. After all, If this sphere carry, carries a charge of positive Q, we'll say, all of that charge resides exclusively on the outermost surface. Now, if we said this sphere was made out of plastic, it would be a different story. Charge could be distributed throughout the entire inner volume. But for conductors, charge always resides on the surface. So there's no amount of charge that sits inside of this Gaussian surface. And if that's the case, then the electric field uh, will be zero. So maybe it gets a bit more interesting if we say what's the electric field if we move the point in question to some place outside of the sphere. So let's make a Gaussian surface. Concentric with the charge passing through the point in question. We know all the electric field lines are going to radiate outward. Okay, and we can consider little patches on our Gaussian surface. DA and A point in the same direction. Say so find E out. We already figured out E in is equal to zero. So find E at points outside of our charge. Step one. Once again, total electric flux is the charge inside our Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught. Step number two, we'll do a couple things. We'll get rid of the vector notation because uh, the angle is going to be zero wherever the electric field meets the little patchwork of area. And we'll also replace Q in with capital Q, just meaning the amount of charge that lies inside our Gaussian surface is all of the charge. The electric field is uniform. It's just as strong for this DA as it is for this DA, as it is for any little bit of the area of an arc on our Gaussian surface. So electric field is constant over the whole surface. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Now, here's where things get interesting. I don't know, not very interesting, but at least 
we have to pay close attention, capital R would represent the radius of the sphere itself. We'll use lowercase r to represent the radius of our Gaussian surface. After all, we could have asked what's the electric field at a point outside that's just a little bit farther away. So we would make a larger Gaussian surface, but that's not going to change the radius of our charged sphere. So the radius of our Gaussian surface is variable, the radius of the charge itself doesn't change, and that's the typical notation, uppercase letters for constants, lowercase for variables. So E equals 4 pi lowercase r squared, uh, I'm sorry, e, e times 4 pi lowercase r squared equals capital Q over epsilon naught. So the final result, the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q over r squared. But you notice that's no different than if we had just a pinpoint of charge of Q. In other words, it acts as if all of the charge is located at the um, center of the sphere. It's almost like there's a center of charge. We can make a graph of the electric field strength versus um, distance from the center of the sphere. So R equals zero at the center. R equals capital R at the surface. And we found that E in is equal to zero. So there's a maximum value to the electric field. And it's equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. times the total charge on the sphere divided by capital R. So the electric field is all zero until we get to a radius of capital R. From there, it starts with its maximum value and approaches zero as r goes to infinity. So now we can consider a hollow sphere. So let's see, we want to know what's the electric field at point A, B, and C. So to find the electric field at point A, we make a Gaussian surface. Immediately, we recognize that the amount of charge inside of that Gaussian surface is zero. So we'll find that E, how about hollow equals zero. So then here we're trying to find E within the metal itself. Let's see, we'll make a Gaussian surface. We'll say that this spherical shell has charge Q. But once again, charge resides exclusively on the surface and exclusively on the outer surface. The charge does not spread out on both the inner and the outer surface. There's no it's not like half the positive charge is on the inner surface and half the charge is on the outer surface. All of the charge resides on the outer surface of conductors. So again, the amount of charge that lies within that Gaussian surface is equal to zero. So E in equals zero. So we make a Gaussian surface coincides with point C, the integral of the vector E dot dA equals Q in over epsilon naught. There's a couple of steps here. One step is to get rid of the vector notation. Another is to pull the electric field out of the integral sign. We know the area of a spherically shaped Gaussian surface is 4 pi r squared, so I'm going to do three steps in one here. 
b times 4 pi r squared. Now, when I say r, what do I mean? 4 pi r squared. Do I mean capital R inner, capital R outer, or do I mean lowercase r, the radius of the Gaussian surface? Yeah, of course, that's the r that I mean, right? So e times 4 pi lowercase r squared equals the amount of charge inside. Well, that's all of the charge divided by epsilon naught. In other words, it's no different whether the sphere is hollow or solid when it comes to points outside. The electric field at any point outside of the hollow or solid metal sphere is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge carried by the sphere divided by r squared which is just the same thing we would have if all of this uh, shrunk down to a tiny pinpoint. The electric field is still the same as long as this still has the same amount of charge, Q. So we make a graph. And the electric field is zero, not just up to um, let's see, I'll show you here, make a dashed line. Yeah, the electric field isn't just zero up until the inner radius, it's zero all the way up till the outer radius. Right, the zero value doesn't stop here. It's zero all the way up to here. And then again, from that point, it just asymptotically approaches zero as r goes on to infinity. And the maximum value is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r outer squared. r inner, r out. Let's take it a step further and imagine a solid sphere that's surrounded by a spherical shell. So let's uh, just say we've got a radius of A for the inner sphere, a radius of B for the inner radius of the outer shell, and then a radius of C for the outermost uh, surface of the spherical shell. Now we want to find the electric field at points 1, two, and three. Well, I'll leave it up to you to use Gauss's law to show that the electric field at this point three is equal to, surprise, surprise, one over four pi epsilon naught times, oh, let's see here. The charge, by the way, I didn't describe this yet. So all of the charge, capital Q, is only on the uh, inner sphere, the spherical shell is neutral. So I leave it up to you to use Gauss's law to show that the electric field at point 3 is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. Now, hint, make a spherical Gaussian surface. Hint number 2, recognize that the only amount of charge that resides inside, or all of the charge that resides inside of that Gaussian surface will be all of the charge that's on this inner sphere. Okay, so let me show you how to find the electric field of point one. Make a Gaussian surface like this. Again, the amount of charge that lies within that Gaussian surface is also capital Q. Hmm. So I think we'll find, once again, 
we get rid of the dot product and the vector notation. We take the e out of the integral sign. We change q in to capital Q. And the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Lowercase r represents the radius of our Gaussian surface. So e equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. So it's the same formula that describes the electric field at point 1 as we get for point 3. That doesn't say that the electric field is the same strength at those two points because the value of r is smaller at point 1 and the value of r is greater at point 3. So there's definitely a weaker field at point 3 than there is at point number 1, which shouldn't surprise you. That's just how it goes. Uh, after all, electric field follows from Coulomb's law, which is an inverse squared law. The farther you get from a charge, the weaker the field gets. So let's see if we can figure out what's the electric field at point number two. So we make a Gaussian surface. Okay, how much charge resides inside of that Gaussian surface. It seems like it would be capital Q, but wait a minute. Before we get too caught up in going through the mathematical steps, let's make sure we've got the right concept here. Let me erase some of this and clean it up. Okay, so we've got the Gaussian surface drawn, but let's think about what we know of charge by polarization. So the innermost sphere has a charge of positive Q. That polarizes the outer shell so that the inner surface becomes negatively charged and the outer surface positively charged. In fact, the inner surface becomes charged to a value of negative Q. So I'll draw all these negative signs around the inner surface. So that leaves us with positive charge on the outer surface. And the amount of negative charge on the inner surface will mirror the amount of charge on this inner solid sphere. So that means, in this case, Q in is equal to positive Q because of the solid sphere plus negative Q because of the inner surface of the spherical shell. Right, positive Q because of the solid sphere, negative Q because of the inner surface of the shell. So if Q in is equal to zero, fast forward, and the electric field is equal to zero. But that's not a surprise. The electric field inside of a conductor is always zero. In fact, we really should argue in that manner. We say we didn't have to go through uh, Gauss's law and figure out that Q in is zero to know that E was zero. We should just know that inside of a conductor, electric field is always zero. And because of that, the Gaussian surface we've chosen has to contain a total net charge of zero. So because of that, the inner surface must carry a charge of negative Q. What's our graph of electric field 
versus distance from the center look like. So we found in, let's see, let's name three regions here. Um, region A is within the solid sphere, B is in the hollow space, C is within the spherical shell, and then D is points outside. Okay, so we know it's zero at points within the metal conductor, and then in points or locations B and D, it follows the formula E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. And again, if you prefer, you can just call that E equals KQ over R squared. Okay, so it's zero and then it jumps up to some value that would be equal to KQ over, what did we call this, A? called that B, we called that C. So the maximum value for the electric field would be KQ over A squared. And then from there, it drops off and goes to zero. Oh, wait a minute, but it's zero in this region. But the electric field picks up once again and drops off to zero from here. In fact, the value at this point would be kq over b squared. And then the value at that point guessed it, kq over c squared, and ultimately the electric field approaches zero, we'll say at r equals infinity, or as r approaches infinity. Okay, one last question, food for thought. Here's a inner sphere, carries a charge of positive six microcoulombs, surrounded by a spherical shell we call q2, that carries a net charge of negative two microcoulombs. So the question is, how much charge is on the outermost surface of the conducting shell? Well, we know the electric field at any point within the metal has to be equal to zero. And if we were to try to apply Gauss's law to find the electric field at that point, We'd make a Gaussian surface. And we know the only way the electric field is going to equal zero is if the right side of the equation in Gauss's law is equal to zero. Q in will have to equal zero. But I already know there's a charge of positive six microcoulombs as part of that Q in. So there must be something else added to that, so that the total amount is zero. Obviously, that would be negative six microcoulombs. So where is that negative six microcoulombs? Yeah, of course, it's all on the inner surface here. So the inner surface carries a charge of negative six, but that wasn't the question. The question was, what's the charge on the outermost surface? Well, the net charge for the whole spherical shell was given as negative two microcoulombs. So there's negative six microcoulombs on the inner surface. So Q2, which is the charge of the spherical shell, is equal to negative two microcoulombs, and that comes in two parts. Q inner plus Q outer. But we know Q inner 
is negative 6 microcoulombs. So now we figured it out. The charge on the outermost surface must be, ta-da, positive 4 microcoulombs. Okay. So there you have it, everything you need to know about spherical conducting shells and how we can use and apply Gauss's law.